So in 1958, Hammer Films released the sequel to their hit gothic horror film, The Curse of Frankenstein, this time, The Revenge of Frankenstein. Because if you got cursed somehow, you definitely want revenge for it. It makes sense, let's go with it. And with this film, they released the best sequel for being a direct continuation that they ever made. What's going on my friends? Welcome again to the Cobweb channel. My name is Daniel. And since we just reviewed The Curse of Frankenstein, I thought, let's keep going. Now, as this is the first sequel in their Frankenstein series, this film really sets the template for what this series is going to be. And it makes the fantastic decision to make the series about following the doctor instead of about following the monster. Now, if you watch the Universal Frankenstein films from from the 1930s and 40s, you'll see that whole series is about following the monster. The original Dr. Frankenstein is only in the first two movies. This series is going to follow Peter Cushing as Baron Victor Von Frankenstein. The monster is gone, but the work continues. Now for this sequel, the director of Hammer's first Frankenstein movie, Master of Horror, Terrence Fisher, returns to the director's chair, and he will go on to direct most, but not all, of the following films in this series. Now this same year, Hammer also released Horror of Dracula, which is probably still their most well-known and most beloved movie, and this film actually reuses several sets from that, so it's pretty cool for a Horror of Dracula fan to see. But since this film is picking up directly where the last film left off, you gotta ask how did Victor Frankenstein avoid the gallows? He's headed to the guillotine at the end of the last movie. What happens? Well, it turns out he just switches out his body somehow, Michael Myers style. Michael Myers, the serial killer? Oh my God, she killed the wrong person. And gets the priest from the first movie beheaded instead while he gets off scot-free. One thing I do want to note about the beginning of this movie is it's the first Hammer gothic film to feature Michael Ripper. If you ask most any Hammer fan, who is the third most prolific actor in Hammer films behind Peter Cushing and Christopher Lee, you got to go with Michael Ripper, a supporting actor who pops up again and again. And here he is as a drunk grave robber who basically sets the stage for Peter Cushing's awesome entrance in this movie, coming out of the shadows in this graveyard. The film then picks up several years later as Dr. Frankenstein is continuing to try to avoid paying for the crimes he made in the first film and continue his work. That's why he's changed his name from Dr. Frankenstein to Dr. Stein. He's very original. You gotta give him credit. Oh... Wow, that's brilliant. Dr. Stein has set up a successful practice for himself in a small town, which really angers the other town doctors because he won't join their little doctor association club and he's stealing all of their patients. He's kind of getting all of the work. And this is where the series now sets up an idea that's also going to follow for several movies later. And that is setting up Dr. Frankenstein as a kind of dashing anti-hero against stuffy bureaucratic snobs. He's managed to steal half my best patients. And mine. Exactly. And mine too. Your uh, wife amongst them, I understand, sir. Yes, well, I put a stop to that. <laughs> In addition to his practice, he's also now doing some charity work as the head doctor of a hospital that helps out poor people and pickpockets alike. And now we're asking the question, has the true monster of the first film now turned over a new leaf and now he's a better person? Ah, not so much. It turns out he's actually doing this charity work to amputate body parts from these poor people. You must have it off. Have one off. This arm? You ain't grab my arm off. That's for sure. If you'd rather die, it's up to you. In order to use them for building a new creature. That's right, it's the ultimate version of exploiting the poor, chopping up their body parts, and using it for your own personal gain. Gotta love it. But at this point, he is working alone, and that's where we meet Dr. Hans Cleave, who shows up and says, hey man, I know who you are, I know you're Dr. Frankenstein, I'm not gonna tell anybody as long as you let me work with you. So he essentially blackmails Dr. Frankenstein into being his new assistant. Dr. Frankenstein seems a little bit annoyed by this at first, but I'm actually kind of surprised how fast they become like best buds. Their bromance kicks off like right away, and I actually really like watching them hang out in this movie. They're a pretty great pair. Dr. Hans Cleave is played by Francis Matthews, or as I like to call him, Discount Cary Grant. I see it as an agreement of, shall we say, mutual reciprocation. Not interested in yourself, you're fascinated, Red. You're far and away your favorite person in the world. You can also see him in Hammer films like Dracula, Prince of Darkness, and Rasputin the Mad Monk, but I actually really like him in this movie. He's my favorite of all of Frankenstein's assistants through the whole series, 
And it kind of breaks my heart that this is the only movie he shows up in. How enjoyable they are to watch together also underscores the serious moral ambiguity that this movie treats Frankenstein with. While in the first movie, like I talked about in that review, he's very much the monster of the film. He is a bad guy. We are not supposed to like him. In this movie, we definitely do like him. Now, he has not turned over a new leaf. He is still a sociopath. He is still doing very bad things. But he's much more likable, and he's even more charming than he was in the first film. And there's definitely no one else for us to consider our protagonist. There's no Paul. There's no hero who's going up against Victor Frankenstein. He's definitely our main character. He's our guy, and still a bad guy. And I really like that. The moral ambiguity of this film is something that keeps me interested in it as I come back to it again and again. And I love this scene where Dr. Frankenstein is showing him his work because we get to see all these severed body parts, including all these body parts that we see in aquarium tanks that are working, that are animated. And it really seems like something you'd be more likely to see in an 80s movie, not a 50s movie. Like this is some Brian Yuzna type stuff. And here it is in a Hammer film in 19. 1958. But okay, it's a Frankenstein movie. We don't get Christopher Lee back as that creature. So what about the monster? What monster do we get in this film? Or do we get a monster? Let's talk about it. So Dr. Frankenstein has another assistant in this film, Carl, who's, I wouldn't say exactly a hunchback assistant, but definitely has some kind of physical disabilities and is very unhappy with his own personal appearance, despite the fact that he's a totally normal, intelligent guy up here. So he becomes a volunteer brain donor for Dr. Frankenstein. Now, Dr. Frankenstein, whether you're looking at the Mary Shelley novel or just the very last movie, he always wants to create a man who is beautiful, who is a perfect specimen of humanity. He kind of gives up on that idea in Curse of Frankenstein by saying, okay, look, the features aren't that important. What matters is the brain. That's what I'm going to get right. He didn't get it right though. But in this film, he does succeed. He does build a body that is conventionally attractive, played by Michael Gwynn, who you also see in Hammer films like Scars of Dracula and Never Take Sweets from a Stranger. But it is just a body. He needs to transfer Carl's brain into this body. And what do you know? He does. And this creature, played by Michael Gwynn, is not a traditional Frankenstein monster in any way. This is something totally different, something we have never previously seen in a Frankenstein movie. Carl's brain is not damaged. The body does not come together wrong once the operation is finished. It's a success. We now have Carl living in the kind of body that he always wanted. And I think this is a time when we have to address the women of the movie. Now, there's really only one female character, although at the beginning of the film, we do see a woman very shamelessly trying to marry her daughter off to Dr. Frankenstein, trying to convince him to listen to her heartbeat by putting his head on her chest. It's very weird. But I'm really talking about the character of Margaret, played by Sylvia Trench. Okay, her name is actually Eunice Gason, but she is definitely most known for playing the first Bond girl, Sylvia Trench in Dr. No and from Russia with Love, though not the main Bond girl in either movie. Always a bridesmaid, huh, Sylvia? She's a woman who comes to work at Dr. Frankenstein's practice. He really seems to have a pretty big staff for being a guy doing wildly illegal things. But when she's introduced, I totally assume she's gonna have a boring romance with Francis Matthews, and this is gonna make Francis Matthews turn against Dr. Frankenstein and become our boring hero, yada, yada, we get it. But no, her romance is actually with Carl, the creature. This makes the movie way more interesting and also I think pretty ahead of its time. I think having a romance with a monster is like very in vogue today. Whether you look at all of the art that exists depicting Frankenstein monster and the bride and their great romantic love that never actually existed in the movie. <coughs> Or when you consider there are two romantic comedies coming out this year in which a woman is in love with basically a Frankenstein monster. Plus like any woman you talk to these days about Beauty and the Beast will say that she much prefers the Beast before he turned into Fabio. As if. Being in love with monsters is in. This is Guillermo del Toro's world now. So I love this aspect of the movie. I love their relationship and it definitely serves to make Carl even more sympathetic than he already was. But Michael Gwynn's performance is so good. He really just drains every bit of sympathy we could possibly have for a Frankenstein monster onto his character. But come on, this is a horror film. It can't just be sunshine and roses the whole time. And it definitely isn't. I love this one part in the movie where Dr. Frankenstein just kind of casually admits to Hans that, yeah, I also did this brain transplant with a monkey and the monkey then became a cannibal and ate his monkey wife. But it's fine. That probably won't happen to Carl. 
girl. Uh... Yeah, you could probably guess where the movie goes from there. Cannibalism. It's pretty awesome. It's uh, pretty extreme. And while Michael Gwynn never has pretty extensive makeup on him to make him look horrifying like Christopher Lee did, he's such a good actor and he uses his face so well to make himself have this transition into a more monstrous form with very minimal makeup. Honestly, he probably should have played Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde at some point. He would have been fantastic at it. So let's go ahead and rate The Revenge of Frankenstein. Now for atmosphere, I'm going to give this one an eight. I definitely like the atmosphere, but I think it's very on par with The Curse of Frankenstein. Still, we're spending a lot of time in laboratories that aren't particularly lavish or gothic. Although I do think we do get more locations in this film. And that graveyard where Victor Frankenstein is introduced is really, really good. The atmosphere of a Hammer film is always going to be great. I'm going to go with an eight. For characters, we're going to bump this thing up all the way up to a nine. Now, while Dr. Frankenstein is easily a 10 out of 10 character all on his own, there are more characters that I'm into in this film than even in The Curse of Frankenstein. I really like Hans. I like him as a partner with Victor Frankenstein. I like that they never have a conflict, that they're always together on this thing. Margaret is a good female lead, but my Michael Gwynn's Carl is so great. For story, this is going to get a nine. It's not quite the perfect classic story that the original film has, but it's a really good direction to take a Frankenstein sequel. I love that they don't do the same thing again. I love that they move the story forward. They move Dr. Frankenstein's work and his skills forward to the next step. It's terrific. For scares, I'm actually going to go with a five. This movie is pretty low on actual horror content. When we get the horror, it's pretty good. I like the references to cannibalism. I like Michael Gwynn's performance as he becomes more horrifying. But this is definitely one of the Hammer films with less horrific imagery than a lot of the rest do. But all in all, I am going to give The Revenge of Frankenstein an eight. I think it's pretty on par with The Curse of Frankenstein. It is awesome. And it also builds to a fantastic ending that moves the story forward to set up for an even more fascinating sequel. But did we get it? Did we? Damn it. That's a wrap for my thoughts on The Revenge of Frankenstein, but what do you think? Leave me your thoughts down in the comments below. And if you enjoyed this, definitely check out this playlist right over here for my other vintage horror reviews. It's definitely something I'm trying to build up on the channel right now. Give a like if you enjoyed this and a subscribe for more videos like this. Thank you so much for watching. With all that said, don't forget to take some time to enjoy yourself today, and I'll see you next time.